Great, let's get started. Thanks everyone for uh, being here so late on Sunday afternoon. Uh, so uh, we're going to be talking about behavioral analysis. And, you know, uh, a couple months ago I noticed on our website that uh, there was a company that had come back to our website three times. And uh, we, we use IP detection software, uh, so, so we can see the specific companies that are coming to, the, to our site and exactly what, what they're doing on our site. And um, so, yeah, you know, they came back three times, which was a good sign, and then they wound up calling us. And so I had a good conversation, and then after that conversation, they wound up coming back to our website 24 times. So think about that. You know, normally when we talk about websites, we talk about the success of websites and the performance of websites, we're really looking at conversions, right? Well, in this case, there were no conversions, right? They hadn't downloaded anything off of our website. They hadn't bought anything. But, but this was hugely, hugely important for us because after several months of discussions with them, they wound up becoming one of our largest clients. And so understanding the digital body language of your site visitors is hugely important and can have a very direct impact on the success of your business, not just your website, but the success of your business. Because just because someone comes to your site and they don't quote unquote convert, doesn't necessarily mean that it's a wasted visit, that there's no value in it towards driving your revenue growth. And so we're going to do a deep dive into behavioral analysis and behavioral analytics today. And hopefully, we'll be able to take away some recommendations to really drive your business growth. So a little background on myself. Um, my name is Tom Shapiro. I'm the CEO of Strategy, which is a branding, web design, and marketing agency. We work exclusively in WordPress. We've always worked only in WordPress. Uh, really love it. Uh, I'm the author of a book called Rethink Your Marketing. It came out last year. You can find it on Amazon. Uh, I'm the founder of a Nora Marketing Group here in Boston. We now have over 400 members. So if anyone's in the Boston area, we'd love to, to have you come to uh, one of our events. Uh, at my last employer, I was the director of digital strategy. I was the 85th employee. And we completely rethought the way that we were driving business and wound up going from 85 employees to over 700 employees in five years. Um, and I've worked with a lot of startups, a lot of middle market uh, companies, as well as a lot of Fortune 500 companies, including AT&T, Packard, uh, Intel, about 10 different brands at uh, P&G, uh, United Healthcare, and others. So that's a little bit about me. Now let's dive into the topic of the discussion. So behavior analytics. You know, we are inundated with data, right? We all have so much data, but, but we have to make sure that we're making use of it, right? Like if, if you are looking at your data, if you're looking at your analytics, and then you're not taking action, it's, it's kind of worthless in terms of driving the performance of your business, right? And so how do you interpret the data? How do you make the most use of it? And a lot of us use Google Analytics, right? Show of hands, how many are using Google Analytics? So pretty much everyone, right? So that's, that's great. And there are a lot of really fantastic data points in Google Analytics. Um, but Google Analytics really only reveals about half of the story. Um, what we need to do is go beyond the what. Google Analytics only really provides you with the what. It doesn't provide you with the why. Why are your site visitors doing what they're doing? Why are they clicking what they're clicking? Why are they leaving when they leave? Why are they abandoning your forms? Why are they doing all these things? Google Analytics won't tell you. And there's a lot of data inside of Google Analytics where, you know, it, it can be misinterpreted and can actually cause you to make the wrong conclusions. So for instance, page views, right? Google Analytics, page views, we probably all look at page views, right? And we think, oh, well, if the page views are high, that was a successful page, right? But not necessarily. Okay, so we, our agency wrote a blog post in 2015, about three years ago, and um, you know we didn't think anything of it at the time, but it really took off and it got over 81,000 unique page views. 81,000, that's 81,000 unique people. You would think that that's hugely successful, right? Anyone looking at Google Analytics would say, wow, man, that's amazing, you know, how did you do it? And we looked at it and we said, okay, well, you know, for, for this type of page view volume, even if we had, say, a 1% conversion rate, you know, okay, we, we, 
should have gotten 800 leads out of this, right? 800 qualified leads out of this with a 1% conversion rate. Imagine if you had a higher conversion rate. So how many leads do you think we got out of this? We got zero. None. Zero. Big fat donut, right? So how is that possible? How is it humanly possible to have 81,000 page views, unique page views, and have zero leads come from that? Right? It's a huge failure. And, and so what we want to do is dive deeper than the Google Analytics numbers. We want to look deeper than just understanding the what. We want to look deeper than something like a page view. Because a page view doesn't tell us anything. So we had a client, an enterprise software client, that came to us and uh, they were very proud of their Knowledge Hub. They had a lot of the great information that you could download in their Knowledge Hub. So if you're in their Knowledge Hub, they had reams and reams and reams of the, these offers where if you click through, you go to a landing page and you can download a white paper or you can download a webinar recording or, or one of the many, many, many different offerings that they had in their Knowledge Hub. They were very proud of this and we looked at their Google Analytics data and sure enough, yeah, it was a substantial part of the traffic and really good solid traffic and so they knew, they knew that it was really popular and successful. Except it wasn't. Because when we looked at the behavioral data as to what people were doing when they arrived, they weren't doing anything. They weren't scrolling down the page at all. They weren't clicking on anything. They weren't downloading anything. The, the offer that they had, that had the most clicks, and remember, this is not a download. This is simply a click to the landing page. The offer on this page which had dozens and dozens and dozens of offers. There was one item that had the most clicks, had a total of three clicks over the prior month. How can you call that successful? It's a failure, right? It's a total failure. Yet they were perceiving their knowledge of as this major success because there were a lot of page views. And so we have to go deeper. And then this is where we're going to begin, right? We're going to, we're going to go down this behavioral analysis road. And I, I think, and hopefully, you'll be surprised at just how powerful this can be. Some of the benefits of behavioral analysis include getting a deeper understanding of your audience, identifying the triggers that influence behavior, increasing engagement, increasing conversions, increasing user acquisition, increasing retention, all fantastic things, right? It makes you a better web designer. And also, in case you have to report into anyone or you have to uh, uh, report into a client, you're able to justify your design, your design decisions much more strongly. So the first place that we like to start, and this is with, with any of our services, certainly with behavioral analysis, is with the audience, right? You first have to know who you're targeting and understand them. You have to understand the who before you can really take action. And so what I would urge you to do is really look at your audience segmentation and your personas. And let me just ask you, how many of you have segmented your audience into different audience segments, whether it's verticals or something else? Okay, so maybe 5% maybe of you, right? And how many of you, if I asked you right now to show me your documented audience personas, so not, not that you know it in your head, but documented. Will you show me right now? How many of you have your personas documented? So maybe one or two people in this entire room, right? So this is your homework. By tomorrow, I want you to document your audience personas. I'm telling you, this is where you start. I can I be blue in the face talking to you about behavioral analysis. If you do not define your audience segments, if you do not define your personas, you're not going to maximize value of this. You have to know who you're talking to and then customize based on who you're talking to. And depending on who it is, you're going to speak to them differently. They're going to have different problems to solve, right? And you're going to have different solutions for each of them. An example that I really like is uh, Domo, it's a software company, where you go to their, their homepage and they ask you to self-select who you are. So immediately, before they start telling you anything about what the software can do, you have to say, oh, well, I'm a marketer, or hey, I'm in finance, I'm a CEO, I'm in operations. And then they have a very customized conversation with you about whatever field you're in, whatever, uh, whatever department you're in. And so I go there, I click on marketing, and absolutely everything is fully customized for me, whether it's the explanations of 
what they can do for me, the problems that they can solve for me, the case studies, the testimony, everything is geared towards a marketer. Beautiful. If I was in finance, it would be the same thing. So we have to go beyond the who, okay? So the audience segments, the personas is the who, but let's go beyond the who and understand why. Okay, if we understand our audience segments, we understand who it is that's coming to our site, okay, the next question to ask is why? I mean, really, why are they coming to your site? They're real people, they're just like you and me. There's gotta be a reason why they're there. They probably have a problem to solve, right? Or a goal to achieve, an objective to achieve. So you really need to figure out why? Why, why are they here? What problems are they trying to solve by being on my site? And is my site specifically answering how to solve that problem or how to achieve that goal? What are you expecting them to do on your site? Don't just build a site, don't just design a site and say, oh, it's beautiful. What behaviors are you expecting them to demonstrate on your site to indicate to you that they are getting full value out of your site? If you don't know the digital body language that you're looking for from them, then who does? What specific actions should they be taking on your site? Right? Should they be downloading something? Should they be registering for an event? Should they be purchasing something? Should they be contacting you for more information? Should they be setting up time for a demo? What are all of those different actions that they should be taking? And again, going back to my original story, it doesn't have to be a traditional conversion, right? Like downloading a white paper or something like that. Remember that the company I told you about was on our site a total of 27 times over the entire course of their journey. What are the different things that they need to be doing in order to keep driving the conversation forward? So, segment your audiences, right? Within each segment, make sure you have a defined persona. And this is what I'm gonna ask you to do. Oftentimes, when you're building a persona, what you're told to do is figure out things like, oh, their age and what city they're in and, and all these, these what aspects of their lives. I'll tell you, I couldn't give a crap about their age. I don't care if they're 40, I don't care if they're 45, I don't care if they're 50. Why? I want to know about the problems they're trying to solve. That's what I want to know. Right? Because who cares if they're 40 versus 50? Who cares? If I know the problem that they're trying to solve, I can then help them solve it. So you'll see that 50% of this persona, 50% is dedicated to what they're trying to achieve, right? What, and and the, the challenges that they have in achieving them. So the problems that uh, Mackenzie's facing is pressure for aggressive growth numbers, right? Her boss, her CEO, is pressuring her for very aggressive growth, but she doesn't understand why conversions aren't higher than they, than they are. So she knows that she has to drive growth, but she doesn't, she doesn't understand why conversions aren't higher. What, you know, where does she turn? What does she do next? She, she doesn't have enough time to get done everything she needs to get done. She doesn't have all the resources that she needs to get done, everything that needs to get done. Competitors are growing more sophisticated all the time. They're using more sophisticated software, more sophisticated data science all the time. She's overwhelmed by the amount of data she has without understanding how to tie it all together, how to make sense of it, how to integrate her marketing. She's confused by the changing tech landscape. You know, uh, back in 2012, I think it was, um, uh, the, the tech landscape had, uh, I forget the exact number, but it was something like, you know, 150 or, or 250 uh, marketing technology solutions. And now it has, what, over 6,000? I mean, we are dealing with chaos. Right? If you're a marketing director or marketing VP, that's the challenge. Those are the problems that you're really dealing with. So how can we help solve them if Mackenzie's our persona? So drive all the way down to the why. And then what you're going to do is say, okay, well, Mackenzie has all these problems, right? So what is her user story? What is she starting with? Where, where, where did she start the process of thinking through her problems and winding up on our website? So document that journey, document the customer journey of the aha moment, like, wow, I'm in, I'm in over my head. I need some help here. I need an expert's opinion. We need to build our team. We're, you know, we need to reach out to an agency, right? So, so when does that all start?
and then document it to the time she lands on your site to everything you want her to experience on your site in order for that to be the ideal experience for her. It might not be the ideal experience for a different persona, but for her it is. Okay, so that's looking at audience segments and personas very, very important from a starting point. Once you have that in place though, now the fun begins, because now we get into the analysis. So let's run through different types of behavioral analysis that, that you can do on your websites. So how many of you today have behavioral analysis software running on your website? One, two, so about, about two or three of you, okay? So behavioral analysis software takes about three seconds to install. Okay, it's super easy. And you know, you can use a cloud solution, so you know, if you pay on a monthly basis, anytime you want to stop, you can stop. Super, super easy to do. And the insights that you can glean from it are, are really amazing. So let's start with scroll mapping, which is one of the things that behavioral analytics software can achieve for you. So with scroll mapping, you're gonna see exactly how far down the page your users are going to the exact pixel. And so here we're on a page, it's the top of the page, it's indicating red, which means you know everyone is viewing it, uh, which is obvious because it's the top of the page, that's where you land it. But as you scroll down the page, you can see the color changes, and it's all mapped to um, the level of scrolling that's taking place. And the software will tell you exactly what percentage of people are driving down your page to the exact pixel. And so you can see, okay, only 50% of my, uh, of my uh, audience is actually getting to this paragraph, or that paragraph, or this CTA button, or, or this, um, this offer. On and on and on. And so, for instance, if you're noticing that only 15% of your uh, page viewers are getting to certain content, but you feel that that content is really important for the success of that page, let's say it's a, it's a call to action, right? And if only 15% of, of the people on the page are viewing it, well then, page views mean nothing, right? It's all about how many actual people are looking at that CTA, right? And so this changes the whole paradigm of how you look at the success of a page, and it also tells you whether people are actually seeing what you need them to see in order for this page to be successful. Another way of looking at this is, besides scrolling, is to cross-reference that data against where are they clicking, where are they hovering, where, where are they spending time, where, where are they moving around on the page. So heat mapping is fantastic because it tells you exactly where they're spending their time on your page. And so even if they scroll down the page, they might have spent 90% of their time on a specific, on a specific <laughs> video, on a specific CTA, looking at a question that you pose in your, uh, in your content. And so for example, in this case, the authenticity paragraph on this page had the highest engagement rate in terms of people spending the most time on this paragraph. However, what, what you also find is that it was after a certain drop-off from a scrolling perspective. So you always need to cross-reference your data, right? And so what this would indicate to us is, ah, okay, well, you know, we're making a mistake by not having this higher on the page because clearly people are interested in it, right? It's the most engaging part of the page, yet, you're, you know, we're, we're not allowing everyone to see it, we're not enabling everyone to see it because we have that drop off from the scroll. So we have a client that, that runs a bunch of events around the country and uh, they have a why attend page in one of their, their event websites. Makes sense, right? You go to the website, it's promoting the event, and you might not fully know why you would spend that much money to go to their event. Uh, you know, it involves the, the ticket price, it involves the hotel, you probably have to fly there. So having a Y10 page makes a heck of a lot of sense for them. Okay, you go to the Y10 page and towards the top there's a, a call to action button, grab your ticket. And there were 33 clicks on this. Okay, we can see using the behavioral analytics exactly how many clicks there were in any given time period. You can filter the time period, okay? So that's that's fine, okay? We want we want them to, to uh, grab tickets, so that's good. The next call to action on the page, lower on the page, is to meet the speakers. And that has 19 clicks. And then we keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling, and download the justification letter has 40 clicks. 
So think about the justification letter. That's something, for instance, if you need to seek a budget from your boss, you can just download this and customize it for yourself and bring it to your boss to better enable you to get the budget to go to this conference, right? So they're arming you with this. And clearly it's very popular. In fact, it's so popular, it garnered twice as many clicks as Meet the Speakers, right? Even though Meet the Speakers is one of the most popular pages in the website. So what does this tell you? Well, we know through the scroll mapping, only 21% of people who visited the page even saw the, just, the justification letter call to action. Only 21%, one out of five. And yet it, it was crushing the Meet the Speakers call to action button. It's obvious. Move it up the page, move it above Meet the Speakers, right? And how would you know that if you weren't looking at the scroll mapping and the click mapping? You wouldn't. You wouldn't know. That's your answer. So this gives you the ability to know exactly what's working on your page, exactly where it's working, exactly why it's working, and then to change your design accordingly, to change the flow of your content accordingly. So another fantastic aspect of a lot of the uh, behavioral analysis software packages is session recording. So this is where it's literally taking a video of your site visitors on your website and showing you exactly what they're doing on your website. So it's anonymous, you, know, you don't see them, uh, you do see their screen, right? You see their cursor, you see what's happening. And when I say that it's anonymous, uh, that, is, that is true for certain packages. Um, and for other packages, you actually can see who it is if they're opted in, right? If they've registered, if they're logged into an account. And an example of that would be, for instance, a software package called Full Story. So in this example, you can see everything that this user, Jill, is doing on this website, the Jane website. Everything, clicking, scrolling, navigating, changing movement, everything is recorded in chronological order. And you can dig deeper and see exactly how long things were taking. You can see everything that this person is doing. On our website, one thing which we found interesting was we were, we were examining uh, the flows of, of how people were navigating through our blog posts. And one of the things we noticed was typically it's a very vertical flow. People will go down the page, but interestingly enough, they also go up the page and then down and up and down and up and down. And so, okay, that's the normal flow, that's the normal uh, navigational pattern on a blog post, or for our blog at least, and that was fine until we looked at this. And we were like, what the heck is going on? It's going all over the place. It's totally chaotic. It's going horizontally, it's going uh, diagonally, it's going all over the place. Very atypical. And what we realized was it was the video that was causing this. Because we looked at the different blog posts that we have with video content, and this is what happened every single time. And so we said, ah, aha. This signals engagement. We need more videos, right? Why does it signal engagement? Because we think with our cursors. We don't even realize we're moving our cursor. And when we lean in, right, when we lean into our screen, we're getting more engaged, and our cursor's moving too. And so this is a clear indication of engagement. You can also find patterns of frustration too, right? I don't know how many of you know rage clicking, where like you click and something doesn't work, <laughs> right? And so you can see all of that through behavioral analytics and say, oh, something's broken on my site, I better fix that. Right? And so it's really helpful both from perspective of what's working as well as what's not working, what's frustrating your users. What's interesting is you can also see exactly when someone takes off for 10 minutes to grab a cup of coffee and come back and finish their session. So another fantastic way that you can do uh, analytics is to see exactly where your users are abandoning the forms on your site. And so for instance, with Google Analytics, what are you looking at? You're looking at whether they submitted your form or not. But, okay, for all of those who didn't submit your form, why not? That's where behavioral analytics comes in. Because you can see exactly what's happening in each field. So, in this example, I don't know if you can see it, the text is a little small, but it's the phone number that is causing a massive, massive drop-off and abandonment rate. Clear answer. Get rid of the phone number in the form. You'll increase your conversion rate astronomically, right? 
And so it's very simple. The data is there. And like I said, it's very easy to implement this type of software. It's, it's usually just one tiny code snippet that you add to your site. But the insights that you can glean from this are invaluable for driving business results. And then not only looking at within a page, right, or within a form, and looking at the diff how each of the different form fields are performing, but across your website, if you have funnels that you know you're trying to drive your users through, you can see how successful those funnels are and where the abandonment rate is in the funnel itself across multiple pages. So this is a software package called Mouseflow. Uh, our agency uses this software quite a lot. And this is just a simple example of going page to page to page. And you can see the massive drop off that you have uh, after the second uh, page. One thing that I'll encourage you to do, if you implement behavioral analytics software and you're looking at the data, I would encourage you to filter and filter and filter the data. Don't just look at the aggregate. Don't look at everyone who comes to your website the same, because they're not. So for instance, if you only sell in the United States, why would you be looking at global data? Yeah, we see it all the time. We see companies looking at global data because that's the default in Google Analytics, right? But why would you do it if you can only sell in the US, right? Or if you sell in the US and Japan, then why don't you look just at those two? You don't need to clutter the data with other country data, right? And so you can, you can segment by, by country, you can segment, uh, you can even segment by city. Um, you can segment by traffic source, whether it was organic, whether it was uh, a specific advertising campaign. Um, you can also, and this is really, really important, when you're looking at your behavioral analytics data, <coughs> try and segment by first time visitors to your website versus repeat visitors to your website. If someone comes to your website for the first time, they're totally unfamiliar with it, right? They have to learn everything from scratch, and they're going to exhibit very specific behaviors to someone who's new to your website. Versus someone who knows your website, right? They've been there two times, three times, four times. They're gonna navigate through your site and behave on your site very, very differently, right? The digital body language is gonna be very different. And so segment the data so that you have more accurate, you have a more accurate understanding of those first time visitors versus repeat visitors. And then, again, you can customize accordingly. So talking about behavior-based triggers and behavior-based analysis, one of the things we implemented on our blog was a behaviorally-based call to action to sign up for our mailing list. So you go to our blog and we don't hit you with a call to action immediately because we know you, you don't know if you like our content or not. We don't know if you find our content valuable or not, right? So what we want to see is your digital body language first. And then we'll hit you up with a call to action if, if you qualify yourself as being interested and engaged in our content. I mean, it makes sense, right? So if someone scrolls 90% of the way down one of our blog posts, we hit them with a subscribe to our newsletter call to action. If they don't, if they only get 70% of the way down, we don't hit them with it. Again, we want to customize the experience to what makes sense. If their digital body language is saying, hey, I love this stuff, well then, you know, let's encourage, let's tell them what the next step is. Let's give them that next step. Opt in, we'll give you tons of this type of content. And if they're, if they're bouncing, why in the world would you just clutter up their experience on your site by hitting them with non-relevant call to action? Or that they didn't give you any digital body language to signal that they would be interested in that. In fact, their digital body language was the exact opposite. It's only that they wouldn't sign up. We did that one change to our blog, and it increased our sign by 300%. By 300%. So think of the digital body language that you want to see from your site visitors that will indicate to you that they're sincerely interested in your value and what you have to offer, and your, whether it's your content, your services, your products, whatever it is, and then hit them up with a very contextually relevant call to action and I, I bet you'll see more success. And then also you can go beyond your website. Um, so everything that we've been looking at so far has been strictly limited to the website itself. But there are software packages out there that will enable you to combine these types of behavioral insights on your website 
with what you're doing in your marketing outside of your website. So for example, SharpSpring is a marketing automation software, but there, there are plenty of others. Uh, HubSpot is another one where you'll be able to see exactly who it is. Once, once you have their email address, once they opt in, you'll be able to see exactly who it is and every interaction that they have with your brand. So you'll see exactly what they're doing on the website, what they're downloading, uh, how they're responding to your emails, and, and it, it provides you with much more holistic insights as to what the who is doing on your site, right? Bob, Mary, Mackenzie, whoever it is, right? What are they doing on your site? What are they doing off your site? What, what kind of content are they engaged with? What are they not responding to? And it gives you a more holistic picture. So I've been talking a lot about the behavioral analytics software, so let me just run through a couple of packages that maybe you can get. So I mentioned Mouseflow. It's a fantastic piece of software. We use it at our agency all the time. I'm in Mouseflow pretty much every single day. I find it incredibly helpful, very insightful. Um, but there are many, many others, and they're all good. They're all good. And you just have to test each of them, or test some of them, and see which is fitting for you. Uh, Heap is another fantastic one. Hotjar, love Hotjar. Full Story, I would say, is if you're more advanced, I would say Full Story would be appropriate. If you're just a beginner, if you're just getting started, it might be a bit too advanced. Um, and maybe start with a more elementary level software. Uh, Crazy Egg is good for beginners. If you've never done behavioral analytics, if you just were gonna dip your toes and see what it's all about, Crazy Egg is super simple, it's, it's very basic. Well, it doesn't have as much functionality as some of these others, um, but, but it's a nice place to start. Uh, and then there's Lucky Yarns and Compara, uh, and I'm sure there are many others that, that I'm missing here. But, but get the idea, that all of these software packages are super easy to implement. One code snippet takes about two to five seconds to implement, and then you can have all of these insights that we went over today. So I hope you found this helpful, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. So we, we tend to work with sites that have, say, a minimum of 5,000 unique visitors a month, um, and some of them you know, go over a million. Um, so I would say, but I, I would say you know, if you have at least 1,000 visitors a month, you, you can gain really good insights out of this, but maybe what you want to do is instead of analyzing the data every week or every month, maybe you analyze it quarterly. Like the, the less traffic you have, you can space out your analyses and it can still be really relevant. If you have more traffic, then you want a faster cadence on your analysis. So be fun just to do. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so, how do you implement this post-GDPR world? Yes. Well, so, they, these software packages have a toggle where you turn it off for your own. So for instance, with Mouseflow, where we implement it for clients, we turn it off. For Europe, we don't even go there. So it is it is not capturing your European data. So if you're all, if you have a large portion of your audience in Europe, yeah, just be aware it's not going to capture that data. What if you want to, you know, follow the spirit of GDPR in the US or maybe California or something? Um, can they opt out of it and then it doesn't track? I'm not aware of any way to to opt out individual users. So if, if you wanted to follow the spirit of GDPR, then you probably, you probably wouldn't want to use this software. It's a cookie. Well, this is definitely cookies here. <laughs> definitely. With Google Analytics focusing more on mobile devices, how does the software work on mobile devices? So that is one of the filtering mechanisms, is you can look at this data strictly for mobile, and only see the mobile data, or you can look at it strictly on a tablet or strictly on desktop. Further to that, you can look at mobile tied to specific campaigns or mobile specific to certain countries or cities. Um, you know, we, we like to uh, drill it down to the city level. If we, if we see through, through our IP detection software, if we see that a specific company is visiting us, at a specific time, like look, we know exactly what minute of the day they're, they're on our site and what they're looking at on our site. So we can map that to the, um, the behavioral analytics to know exactly what they were doing on our site. 
And so there's so many different ways to filter this. Uh, that's why I was encouraging you, really, you know, instead of just looking at it in the aggregate, do like you're saying, you know, filter by mobile, filter by desktop, filter by, by country, filter by city. There are many, many different ways to filter. What do you use for ID detection software? So we use an application called Lead Forensics. Um, there, are, there are many out there, though. Lead Forensics tends to be on the more uh, robust, expensive side. Um, but there are cheaper options out there. There's one called Lead, I think it's called Lead Feeder, which is also very, very good. Um, and if you just Google it, uh, there, there are a bunch of applications that they can do it. So the software applications have many of case many case studies on their websites. We're not able to provide a case study of this because it would be revealing secret sauce for our clients and giving away a little too much uh, to the competition. And so the software, if, if you go to, to Mouseflow's website or Hotjar's website, they have plenty of case studies of the before and after effects, um, and they're and they're fantastic to learn from. Uh, so later today, um, if you just go to, um, my, my Twitter handle is at Tom Shapiro. Um, and so just go to at Tom Shapiro. And, and you know, we'll also post it on the Strategy uh, Twitter feed as well, just at Strategy. Uh, so you can download the, the, uh, uh, the slides if you'd like. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thanks, Tom.